Speakers Organization. I am Joel Gandara. I've been an entrepreneur since the fourth grade, like legitimately since the fourth grade, I've been making money. And uh, I'm a new author, just wrote a book. And I want to thank Sean Thomas from Accelerators Organization for uh, buying a bunch of copies. Thanks, Sean. That's awesome. The book is called 31 Days to Become a Better Man. Super happy because I've never written a book. That was my first one. I'm very happy with it. All right, let's jump into these questions. Uh, so aside from now being an author, uh, entrepreneur, I own apparel brands, I built those from the ground up, but I have bought some competitors in, along the process. And what else? I have a fulfillment center for e-commerce websites uh, that give us their products and we ship them out. So those are some of the experiences that I have, but I have been coaching people for many years, coaching entrepreneurs. And so I get to learn a lot from different people's situation and, and get to cross them over. Because sometimes somebody has an issue, it just happened yesterday. I have a, a coaching client with a big electrical company and he's presenting an issue to me. And I had immediately two almost identical stories with a supplier and, and they were in to two totally different industries. So that's why I think it's important to listen to these uh, mentor sessions. You might say, well, I didn't have any questions. I don't have to watch it. But you can learn from hearing someone's problem and then hearing another person's solution. So all the way around, you get to learn quite a bit. All right, I have the questions on my phone here. So let's jump into those. First one is from Alex Wilkins. Should overtime be optional or mandatory? Here's the background for that. I have a landscaping business here in Pennsylvania. I'm, I am anticipating a really busy year and sometimes I have a light crew and wanna know how to get the most work out of them when I don't quite have enough team. What are ways I can get them to work more hours and do I have to pay overtime? Well, the government is probably gonna tell you if you have gotta pay overtime and my guess is if they go over 40 hours, yeah, they do have to get paid overtime. I'm not an attorney, uh, so don't take my word for it, but you can probably Google it real quick or call some state office in your, in your state, some government office in your state. And odds are they're probably gonna say, yes, you do in the United States. Uh, I think, I don't know if that's a federal thing or that's a state thing, but I don't know of any place that doesn't require uh, paying overtime. Now, if your business has maybe multiple segments and you have, and I, I'm not an attorney, I'm just, Throw, throwing stuff out there for you to ask an attorney. What if you had two separate corporations and one does landscaping and the other one does something kind of like landscaping, but it's a little bit separate, like picking up stuff and throwing it out, hauling or something. And an employee could potentially work 40 hours here and 10 hours over there. And maybe that wouldn't require overtime, but I would talk to an expert on that. I really have no clue. Another option is if someone is an employee, W-2 employee, yes, they're gonna get overtime. If they're a 1099 independent contractor, they don't, have, they don't get paid overtime. However, people misuse this all the time. They classify somebody as a 1099, but then they tell them when to come to work, what to do, when to leave, that's an employee. You could just Google the difference between a W-2 and 1099 employee. W-2 is a regular employee, 1099 is an independent contractor, like a plumber that might go to your house and just do a job. You could qualify that maybe as a as an independent contractor, but that's not a uh, an employee. So if the plumber takes ten hours, you don't have to pay him overtime. You just paid it for the work that was done. But your job seems like it's actually hourly. Now, as far as getting more out of your workers, I know it's a tough job. It's physical. It's out in the elements. It's hot. It's cold. It's rainy. It's you know it's a rough job. But if you're part of the team, not just the boss, but you're part of it and you're getting your hands dirty with them and you're working hard and you're motivating them, I think you will see, maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10% better productivity out of all your workers, but you gotta set that example. That's the only part you can control, right? The other one is not have bad workers. It's not fair to the good workers. Let's say you have six guys out there in a crew um, and one's really lazy and he's not getting in trouble and he's not getting fired. Well, guess what? The next guy is just gonna start dropping his performance and the next one will drop. And then pretty soon uh, that one bad guy brings down five pretty good workers. So keep that in mind. Those are things I always see. All right, Alex, I hope that's helpful. Next question is from Josh Sierra. Hold on. He's asked before, and I know his name. Sierra. Okay, Josh Sierra Ramitara. Sorry, it's a tough Italian name for me to say. All right, if I want to put a plan together to quit my full-time job and be a full-time business owner, what are the things I should take into consideration? I am a partner in a new company, not much revenue, 
but I want to put a plan together with milestones. So once I reach a certain milestone, I can quit. What milestones would you want to achieve to quit the job and go all in? All right, so Josh, I've been there. You know, I started from the bottom. I started uh, very poor. I used to go to garage sales and buy stuff, take it to the flea market. I did that through high school and I started building it up and it took me many, many years. But all through that time, I had a job. Well into my 20s, I still had a job. It wasn't until late 20s that I quit and I haven't worked for anybody since. And, and I always wondered the same thing. I thought, well, when do you, when do you know? When's the moment? When do you quit? Um, it's when you can not live off of your, I think, I mean, there's a million ways to calculate this, but when your job income is being put in the bank, let's call it a separate bank account and you're not even touching it. And your business income is enough that now you're comfortable. You're living, you're paying all your bills, you're not getting into debt, you're not adding up credit cards, nothing like that. So that's when you realize mathematically that, oh, I don't even need that job anymore. Now, if I didn't have that job, what can I do? I could start, you know, really putting focus into this business and really growing it. But I know that might be a chicken or egg dilemma because you might say, yeah, but I can't really skyrocket my business until I quit my job because I just don't have the time of the day. That's a whole different story. That's a tough one. Um, you, you know, it, it depends on your, your level of risk, how, how thick skinned you are. Can you take that pain that's going to come because you're going to have little income or none for three months, six months. Do you have that kind of, um, uh, money around? Do you have any other income? Is your spouse working? You know, I, you'd have to calculate all of that, but a really easy one is to say, yeah, I, I make 50,000 in my job and I'm now making 40,000 in my business. I'm not even touching the 50. I'm living off the 40 and, and now I can make that jump. So uh, as far as prep preparing yourself, I would say cut all costs. What things you spend your money on that are keeping you from it, right? Um, do you have Netflix? Do you have cable? Do you have an expensive car? Do you, if, if, it, if you added those up, would that bridge the gap? You know, you're making 10,000 a year on this business, but you make 50,000 in your job, but do you have enough expenses that at least you can get to saving an extra 15,000 a year, let's call it, just to save something. And now that puts you your 10 income in the business plus 15 in savings, you get to 25. Can you live off 25 for a few months while you build that income back up to 50, 100, 200, a million? So those are kind of things to consider. I don't think there's a perfect formula for everybody to do, but, but just think about that. All right, next question is from Ricardo Delgado. Is being a barber uh, only, or owning a barbershop what I should do long term? I've owned my barbershop for three years and I'm making a living, but I can see that there is only so much money to be made in a shop and as a barber. And I was wondering what you think. If I wanted to make 10 times as much, do I stay in this industry or do I transition to another industry like consulting or something else? What would you do if it were you? That's a tough one, Ricardo, because I don't see how you run your business. I don't, I don't know that. Maybe there's holes in it. Maybe there's something that's keeping that barbershop from taking off because, it, you know, and I, I've seen barbershops that, that do phenomenally well and I've known the owners and I know what they're doing and, and they tightened it up. They, you know, their, their appointment setting is on point. Um, they're friendly. Everybody's very nice. You know, they give the kids a candy and a toy box, and, you know, and all these sort of fun things that just keep it. And I've seen, you know, 20 people waiting with all eight or 10 barbers working and the people just keep coming in appointments, not appointments, and people are waiting because they love that barbershop. I've seen that multiple times. If you're running your business like that, because I'm going to guess that you're not because you're because of your question. Normally, when you ask a question like that, it's because, you know, it's, it's okay. It's not going spectacular. So you're in it. You've been in it for three years. I would question what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And I would go full throttle on that one barbershop first before you make a decision, either way, whether it's to go consult or go open five more barbershops, whatever it is, I would make sure this one is perfect, as perfect as you can make it. Look like a McDonald's, you know, McDonald's didn't go and open 10,000 restaurants overnight. They perfected the craft, the efficiency, the supply, the way you get the fries out of here and dump them here and give them to the client. It's all been done just right so that, um, you can replicate that. So my thought would be you want to do 10 times and open 10 barbershops, but maybe you just have to open five of them. And maybe if you do really well with your barbershop, you don't have to work anymore. Imagine that you make the exact same income today because you rent out the chairs and you have enough 
so busy, you just keep running them out and they're open seven days a week and you're crushing it, um, you may not have to work anymore. You can go focus on opening the next one and go, I don't know, 50 blocks away, 40 blocks away and open the next one, find a good spot and, um, and then do it again. Start working in that one. Fill up all the seats with barbers, rent them all out, walk away, right? And if you could keep doing that, I don't know your age or I don't know your appetite for, for work, but that, that's a possibility. Now, if you can go, if you tell me you can go and consult and go make 300,000 a day, maybe that's a thing to do if you don't want to go build all of this, but you're already in this industry, you know it better than 99% of the people. Um, why not explore that and just do it the best you can? Because if you're not doing it the best you can, what's going to happen? You might go jump to another industry and you might be given 80% there as well. And then that's not so great. So you jump to another one, you give 80%, give 100% to what you're doing. Go get a consultant, a coach, somebody to help or go see what's out there. Go watch YouTube videos, whatever it is, and make sure that you're banging out the absolute best barbershop in the area so that all your competitors start suffering and losing clients and you start getting them. And pretty soon you can go buy out those competitors and make them your barbershops. I've actually seen that um, barbershop I used to go to. The barber wasn't doing a good job. It was the very first seat that was the owner and the rest of them he rented out. And all the barbers there were really nice and, and friendly and, and great guys. And I went there for years, but the owner was not friendly. That very first chair, he would just look at you with a grumpy face. He'd tell you who to go see. He'd charge you. Um, it wasn't a good job. Well, guess what? Years later, I found out he still works there. Now he's an employee. He lost the business. He sold it to a competitor. Uh, now he's just an employee there. So anyway, went on a fun tangent, but look at those different possibilities. I hope something I said may spark question or, or a thought that you could follow up on and, and explore. All right, Ricardo, hope that helped. Let's see, the next question is from Belinda Wood. How did you narrow in on one business to build when in the beginning you might be doing a few and you also know that someday there is even something else that you want to do longer term? I'm involved in quite a few things to make a living now, like divorce coaching, small business coaching, real estate, etc. And I don't really have a team and I feel a little lack of focus. Should I, should I go all in one thing or dabble in a few and what are pros and cons? Okay. Pros of what you're doing is multiple streams of income. You're diversified. You might make a little money here, a little money there. If you're happy with that. Great. Uh, it doesn't sound like you might be because you're asking these questions. So there's something there. Um, as far as, Picking one thing, I don't know that just, you know, you don't just pick these out of a hat and say, okay, I'm going to do divorce coaching. I like doing whatever the market says. I love capitalism. I love free markets. You give people what they want and then you get a reward and everybody's happy. That's why capitalism is so great. I was born in socialism, which is not so great because the guys on top are trying to pick what everybody's going to need and what they want, and how many hot dogs need to be made and, and how many shoes need to be made. It's horrible. The market will decide what's best. So, I would explore, you know, this is a great whiteboard session. I do this with coaching clients. Um, I just did it this week where I went into their office, their leadership team. We, uh, we wrote down a ton of problems and then we enumerated them. What's number one, number two, number three, four, five, six, seven. We got to like number 14. And then we started attacking the problems for number one. And that's the only thing we're working on for the next few months is attacking the number one problems in, the, in those doctor's offices that I coach. So similarly here, I would write all this out on a board. You don't have to have a consultant, a coach, anything. You could write them out. All right, divorce coaching. What are the pros, cons? Do I want to be doing this? How much can I really make? The size of the market. Number two, business coach. You know, same questions. And just go down and let that soak in for a few days and do a little soul, soul searching, a little exploration to see where you get to. So let's see. Um, let me reread part of this. Okay. So you, your, your one question is, um, you know, when, when, when I was early on, at least for me, I can speak for myself, I was doing a few things. I had a job, I had a little part-time job, I had this little business, and um, I just kept exploring and kept trying and seeing, okay, well, this made me $1,000 last month. Let me see if I put a little more attention into it, if I can get it to $1,500, then if I can get it to $2,000, and everything has gone like that. It's just a little exploration, and I still go through it, just so you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this, I own a, a fulfillment center, and I own apparel brands and e-commerce websites. Uh, I have a coaching business. I have different things, and I do explore in each one, and, and yes, now I've gotten it to the point where I have people who help me run it, 
And so it's not just me trying to do it all. Um, but I'm always exploring. What if I could do this in this business? And that's it. Like, I'll give you the example of my coaching business. I started coaching entrepreneurs. It started because I've been mentoring for 20 years. And Sean Thomas from here, Accelerators Organization, planted the seed and said, hey, some guys want you to coach them. Why don't you do that? And I started doing it and developed a business out of it. And then I started finding kind of a niche within that coaching. And it's coaching men on being better fathers and, and, dad, and uh, husbands and all that stuff. So I, this happened not because I picked this business. It's because I started finding a need in the market. I started coaching a lot of people, some men, some women, some singles, some married, you know, all kinds of people. And then I started saying, oh, there's a niche there that I'm pretty good at. And there's a big need in the market that I could service, right? It's all about where do you bring value? You bring value to the market. And again, you will be rewarded for that value, but you got to really be good at it and, and convince people that you're good at it and start getting those results. And then they'll start recommending you. So if you're a small business coach and you're really good, you're going to start getting people to recommend you. Um, if you're an amazing divorce coach and you're coaching women who are divorced or whatever that is, they're going to tell their friends, right? And you can ask them to tell their friends and then you can grow that way. So hope that helps, Belinda. All right. Next question is from Kimberly Benjamin. She asks, what tools and routines can I use to stay focused for my business? I have always been a hard worker slash hustler mentality, but now I am about to begin going all in on one niche, one product. How can I stay focused? What tools or ideas can you share to help me stay very focused on the sales and operations of my new business that I see tremendous potential. All right, Kimberly, congratulations. So far, you're, you're making progress because you found something that you're going to be able to dive into. I hope it's market driven. I hope it's not just because you love this, but it's because, wow, there's something here. I see potential sales are starting, whatever that may be. All right. As far as staying focused, that's up to you. You got to be excited about this product. Um, and I, and I also, you know, this leads to more questions like what could keep you from staying focused? What What is it that might be drawing you away? Is it shiny object syndrome? You know, like a lot of entrepreneurs have, they're going this way, but then they see something, oh, look at that. And they keep jumping around. I say, take this one to the end and focus on it until you get to a point where you realize, okay, this is amazing. It's taking off or, okay, I, this isn't giving any return. It's not what I thought, but take it to the end. And how do you do that? I think you develop a why. What's your reason for doing this? Um, go through that process. There's a good book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why. It's a huge magnet. It pulls you in the right direction that you established was right. When you were relaxed and calm and sitting down and strategizing, you said, I want to do this. Now, life starts and emotions and ideas and, and you get drawn away. But remember, you develop this why over here and you should be working to get to it. Um, I like reminders. I like things in my phone that pop up and say, for example, Joel, you decided you wanted to do this thing, stay on task, right? And that might pop up every five days, every week, whatever it is, you put reminders in there that pop up routinely. I put a little sticker on your mirror while you brush your teeth every day, multiple times a day, hopefully. And you see that and it reminds you, that's right, I'm doing this thing, I'm doing this thing. Sharing the idea with people, right? Having an accountability partner, having a coach, all of these things are fantastic for following through on the things that you say you want to do. That happens a lot. I see people say that they want to accomplish this thing, but then I don't see the action. They don't take the action to get to that thing. So set what you want. It sounds like you already did. You have this item, this product business that you're going to focus on. Set up all the steps and stay on task and set the reminders and, um, and, and share it with people and let, let you know, have you don't have to hire a coach. You know, I'm a coach. So I hate saying hire a coach, but I say it all the time. I said it before I was a coach when I was just mentoring people. Get somebody who's going to call you out on your BS when you say, yeah, I really want to do the thing and I'm working toward it, but I've spent the last day doing this. And oh, that person's going to be able to go, wait a minute, you just told me this. Stick to it or drop it. You know, pick it's one or the other. So like people don't, you shouldn't get kind of married. You should probably get married or not get married, but but don't do it in between or don't kind of have, ki have kids. You either have kids or you don't have them, right? So same thing with a business. Go in it. Uh, yes, always have your mind open and your eyes open for potential opportunities, but don't fail at the thing that you're doing. Give it 100%. All right, the last question is from Lissandra Wilson. What things can I do to keep thinking bigger and build a bigger brand than just myself and my husband? I have a baking business and specialize in custom cakes and dessert tables. 
It's mostly me and my husband, and I really want to grow and build something. Would love to know what you did to build what you built and some things I can do to break through these limited mindset beliefs. All of these were fantastic questions, but I love Lissandra's as the final question because it's all about mindset. I, I've said this a million times. The difference between, I saw this in my life, the difference between making a $50,000 income and making a million dollar income was right here. It's only a few inches right there. It was just the way I started thinking and the way I started seeing things. And I've recommended this book to thousands of people because whenever I speak to any group, I always recommend it because it comes up in the questions. What's your favorite book? What helps you think positively? It was The Secret by Rhonda Burns. I read that book years ago. I applied it 100% in my life. You know, nothing's magic. You don't just read a book and then your life starts changing. But I read the book and I started applying it. I started thinking positively because I got myself, I grew up in a small mindset, you know, grew up poor in the ghetto and everybody was poor around me. Nobody ever thought big. Um, and if someone ever did, they think they were crazy. So I didn't have those role models. I didn't have mentors or coaches or anything like that. So I think that if you read that book and start applying it, and then here's another thing. Start changing who you hang around with, change who your circles are, change your social media friends. You have to change because if you just said it, you're stuck in a mindset that's small right now. Look all around you. A large part of that is because of people who are around you. So when you eventually, and I hope you do, get to this totally different status where you're making 50 times more than you're earning today, you have a better life, you built something beautiful, you're employing 40 people in a bakery, and it's all going phenomenal. I promise you that the people around you are going to be completely different because these people think a certain way and these people think a different way. Now, you could wait till you get there and then start changing your friends, but you're probably not going to get there because you haven't changed the influences in your life. So it's about what you read, the podcasts that you listen to, the friends that you have, the events that you go to. You got to surround yourself by different people. Otherwise, you're just going to be the same person. And again, I like that you said it, that you're stuck in that small mindset. So that should be your biggest indicator. You're stuck. You know, you're stuck in a, in a pit of mud, get yourself out of the mud, and then you're going to start seeing things differently. But use those aids, like The Secret, phenomenal book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, another great book for anyone who's in business and anyone who's not in business. I teach those things to my kids all the time just because they're the best life lessons. So there's a lot of things you can do. I hope you'll start incorporating those, and uh, I think you'll start seeing the changes, and maybe we'll lose contact. I don't know you. Maybe you don't know me. But I hope this works because in five years, you might say, oh, yeah, you won't even remember that I recommended it or Accelerators Organization or whatever. But you'll read that book and I think it'll make a lasting impact if you do all the right things and take all the right steps. All right, guys. Again, I'm Joel Gandara. It was great to uh, be here with you. You guys always ask phenomenal questions. And those who ask the most questions, I think, are not only giving themselves the most value, you're helping the rest of the group here because they get to hear your problem and the so potential solution that these mentors present. All right, guys. Have a great day. Thanks a lot.